I graduated fifth grade in 1993. I remember that because my fifth grade year was 92-93, and 92 was the fall of the uh, 92 election, which was pro-Clinton Bush. I, and for whatever reason, the only memory I have of fifth grade is that in the small rural tobacco town that I grew up in, for whatever reason, Perot won in a landslide amongst my fifth grade peers. But this is not a sermon about politics. I simply bring that up as a cultural touchstone to identify that I was in primary school in the late 80s, early 90s, a time in which the world did not subscribe to the idea that everyone gets a ribbon, and certainly no one got a trophy just for showing up. We were told that if you lose, that just builds character. And throughout my primary school career, through five field days, that day in the spring where there were races of every imaginable kind, sprints and three-legged races and potato sack races and egg and spoon races, I went 0-5, never getting the blue ribbon for first, red for second, or yellow for third. The same could be said for the science fair projects that we submitted because we were forced to, and the top three Projects across various categories would also receive ribbons, another reality that I went O oh, for five. This idea that you get what you deserve, or sometimes you just lose, was also underlined even at church camp as the summers would come by. Because inevitably, at church camp, we would read the story of the prodigal son. You know the story. There's a father who has two sons. One of the sons says, hey, dad, I, I want my inheritance now. I'm going to go do what I'm going to do with it. I'll be fine on my own. I just want to uh, cut rope now and go. I want to live my life. Give me my inheritance and be done with me. So his father gives him his inheritance and he goes out to strike it on his own. He makes a bunch of foolish decisions. He squanders the money on NFTs or whatever people were buying in the first century, I suppose. And then that son finds himself slopping hogs, looking at the slop that the hogs are eating, and he thinks to himself, you know, even the slaves at my father's property eat better than I am right now. I am jealous of these hogs for what they are eating. Maybe, just maybe my father would take me back. Maybe not as a son, maybe just as a slave, but even if that were the case, I would be better cared for than... I am now on my own. And so that son makes the long walk home, back to his home, back to meet his father. His father sees him coming down the driveway and jumps up with excitement and runs to his son, grabbing him, holding him, hugging him, kissing him. He calls for the robe and the ring. He calls for the slaughter of the fatted calf. It's time to celebrate. This son that he thought was gone forever, has returned. The older brother, the brother who was there the whole time, the brother who never left, the brother who put in the work, who didn't squander his inheritance, was upset. What did he get for being there the whole time, for not messing up, for putting in the work? As a child, and even as an adolescent, I think it's easy to be on the side of the older brother. Shouldn't the person who put in the most work get something why is this one who wandered away celebrated more so than the faithful brother who had stayed in, who had done the job? I once heard this sermon preached on from the point of view of the fatted calf. It was an interesting take on the sermon. The preacher was talking about when the calf was born and how the calf grew up watching the interaction between the father and the two sons. How the calf remembered the day when the younger son walked away with a bag over their shoulder. I took that to mean his inheritance there in hand. The preacher went on to say that the calf noticed that the longer and longer that the son was gone, the slower and slower and more despondent the father seemed to be, showing up later and later for the morning chores, staring off, crying more, praying more. The calf noticed how it changed the lives of both the father and the son. Until one day, when the calf was in the field, it noticed the father jump up from his chair and run down the driveway. 
embracing with the son who had went away, who had now returned. As that sermon ended, it kind of took a dark twist because as the calf saw the father send for the ring and the robe for the prodigal son to put on and wear in celebration, the calf just wanted to be part of that celebration of this family reconciling. Seems odd as we know how that story goes for the calf's sake, but that's not the point of this. The reason I share that now is because I loved the idea of taking the story of the prodigal son and shifting it from a story about one person who squanders their inheritance, has a realization, and then comes back. Shifting that to the story of a father and his sons, a father who loves the two of them, a father who loves this opportunity to celebrate a family that is put back together regardless of how long that son has been away or what that son has done or hasn't done with that money. The power being the reunification and the fact that the family is together. Today's gospel reading is called by some scholars the story of the prodigal employer, and there are similarities between it and the prodigal son. In our story, the main character Kind of like the cow retelling the prodigal son, our main character is the landowner, the one who calls workers in to work in his field, the one who pays those workers, the one who talks with those workers at the end of the parable. And in this story, we have people who have been working for different amounts of time, some early, some at 9 a.m., some at noon, some at 3, some at 5 in the way that one of the brothers worked the whole time and the other brother left for a while and then came back. But as we turn our attention to this parable in the 20th chapter of Matthew's Gospel, let's consider a few things. First and foremost, let's underline the idea that this is a story about the landowner. The landowner is the primary actor. The landowner is the one who goes out and finds people to call in to work the field. The landowner is the one who makes the invitation over and over and over again. The landowner is the one who pays those who have been laboring in the field. The landowner is the one who talks to those in the field at the end of the parable. This is a parable about what the landowner is doing. A reminder that especially in worship, we gather around the power of what God is doing. God is the primary actor in worship. We come into worship from wherever we are. Maybe every week, maybe every month, maybe it's been a while. Maybe it's the second time you've been in a building or a house of worship in a day. Regardless, God loves you and blesses you and holds you the same way. Regardless of how long you have been or how long it's been, God feeds you through the power of the sacrament of Holy Communion, blesses you in the water of baptism, and hears your prayer to the same degree of every other person. Worship is about what God is doing as we celebrate the power of what God has done in Jesus, who is the Christ, regardless of how long it's been since we have gathered in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Second, notice that this parable, like many parables in Matthew's Gospel, begins, The kingdom of heaven is like... And then the story goes on to give a lot of different parts. The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner. The kingdom of heaven is like people who are called at different times of the day. The kingdom of heaven is like people who have worked for differing amount of hours. The kingdom of heaven is like people who are grumbling because they don't like what they are seeing with the way that the field or the laborers is being run. That's true for any of us that have been in a church. It's not the best realization or reflection that the kingdom of heaven is like people who grumble, but we are imperfect people, sanctified and redeemed by the blood of Christ. The kingdom of heaven is like a God who calls us in, and us, imperfect people who gather, even though we tend to grumble, and despite our grumbling, God has still called us, and God still loves us. For a second, consider this. There's no reason 
If everybody is paid the same amount, which is the case in this parable, everybody is paid the same amount, regardless of how many hours they work that day. And since that is the case, there is no real need for the last to be paid first and the first to be paid last. It's done very intentionally so that those who have been there the whole day can see firsthand the generosity of the landowner. The reason that it sticks out that the last will be first and the first will be last is specifically to show off the generosity of the landowner, to show the grace and the love and power of God in this parable form. And that brings us to the last point, and that's this. In this parable, we have a vision of the end of time, of the end of days. Because consider this, all of the action of this parable happens at the end of the workday. Time is up, the sun is setting, it's time to get paid and go home. Everything is finished. This is a parable about the end of time, the end of the world, the return of the Messiah, however you want to think about it in that regard. There are those who have been in the church much longer than other people. Some people who are cradle Christians and some people who have come much closer to the end of their life. And yet all of them are loved, sanctified, and redeemed the same way out of the generosity of God Almighty in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Martin Luther's famous mantra is that we are saved by grace through faith apart from works. We are saved by the grace of God, which is a gift, through our faith, which we also receive as a gift. Saved by grace through faith, apart from works, whatever those works may be, or however long we may have been doing those works. We are saved not because of them, but because of the generosity and love of God Almighty. This simple and powerful truth is one of the things that allowed Christianity to light a fire that spread over the entire world. That at the end of it all, it doesn't matter if you are the missionary or the one who has just heard the gospel. God loves you, and you are saved the same way. Receive the blessing and the grace of God. The love of you, love from a creator to God's creation. That there is a place for you, that there is a blessing for you, as we gather, not as we ought but as we are able, held and sustained by the power of God our Maker. Thanks be to God. Amen.